Uh, we're going to welcome Dr. Karen LaRusso here tonight. It was about two years ago I twisted her arm to give us a talk, and every time I went in for an appointment, she kept saying, yes, 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 I will, I will, I will. So it finally came about. <laughs> uh, since 2005, Dr. LaRusso has been a medical physician at St. Vincent Cancer Center in Santa Fe, specializing in hematology and oncology. Well, what led her to this position is the following. Undergraduate degree in biology from Columbia University, MD, Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, internship and residency at the University of New Mexico, followed by a fellowship at the University of New Mexico, followed by a fellowship at the University of Virginia. And then she finally landed up here in Santa Fe. While well, at St. Vincent Cancer Center, she became board certified in three areas, internal medicine, hematology, and oncology. So all of this is very impressive professionally. She also provided us some personal information. I'd like to share that with you. <laughs> Go ahead. On the personal side, she lives in Santa Fe with her husband, Alexander, and two children, Ryan and Darcy. She enjoys participating in a number of outdoor activities and reading sci-fi and fantasy fiction and cuddling tofu, which is her big Bernice mountain dog, if you, if you couldn't guess. <laughs> Can I turn it over to uh, Dr. LaRusso? All right, well, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, tonight I'm gonna be talking about melanoma. Um, let me see if I get this right. Yeah, there we go. So I was asked to give some goals uh, for our talk tonight, and so I have three goals. One is to recognize the presentation and natural history of melanoma. The second is to understand the surgical and medical treatment of melanoma. And the third is to understand the new research and breakthroughs that we've made in melanoma treatment. So this is Rochester, New York. This is where I did my medical school. Now you know why I'm here in New Mexico. <laughs> so Rochester, it snows from October to May, has 300 cloudy days a year. So there's a lot of vitamin D deficiency in New York and not a lot of melanoma. Whereas we kind of have the opposite problem here. We have a lot more skin cancer in New Mexico. Um, melanoma really, uh, I think, uh, came to the front a few years ago when ex-president Jamie Carter was diagnosed with melanoma. Uh, and this was in 2015. Um, he announced that he had melanoma, but not only melanoma, that the melanoma had spread to his brain. So it was widely metastatic. Um, he was treated with surgery and radiation, but in addition, he got one of our new medications for melanoma, something called immunotherapy. Um, and with that, he went into remission, and he is still in remission now three years later. To put this into context, when I was in medical school in Rochester in the mid-90s, it would have been expected uh, for him to have, you know, maybe six months to live, so we've really made some good strides with melanoma, and that's part of what we'll talk about tonight, okay? I just want to start by talking about the skin in general. The skin is actually a really complex organ. Um, it's kind of divided into two parts. You have the epidermis, which is the very top layer, and then the dermis underneath. The dermis has things like the hair follicles, the oil glands, the sweat glands, the blood vessels and nerves. And on the top uh, is the thin protective layer. And it's kind of hard to see on this, um, but there are three types of cells in that top layer. You have the squamous cells, which are on top, and then you have a basal layer on the bottom. Within that basal layer are the melanocytes. The melanocytes are where melanoma comes from. Melanocytes make pigment. They're what give our skin its color. So when we talk about melanoma, we're talking about the cells that come from that very bottom layer of the skin. 
And the skin is an organ. A lot of people don't think about their skin this way, but there's a lot going on with your skin. So it protects us against injury and infection. It helps us regulate our body temperatures, protects us from UV radiation, um, it's very important in vitamin D synthesis, it maintains our water and electrolyte balance. Um, it's involved in the immune system. And of course, it gives us our sensory perception of touch and temperature. So there's a lot going on in the skin. So those top three layers of skin, those three cells, the squamous cells, the basal cells, and the melanocytes, this is from where we can get skin cancer. The squamous cells on the very top, they can, cause, they can um, develop into a squamous cell cancer. So these are small uh, red nodules on the skin that can get very scaly uh, or rough. Uh, typically, they uh, grow just very locally and are removed by doctors either with cryotherapy or um, uh, excision. Um, and usually that is the only treatment needed. The other cell, the basal cell, can also cause a type of skin cancer. These tend to be more pearly and pink bumps, sometimes with a little ulcer right in the middle. Um, and these also grow locally. We tend to treat them with a the liquid nitrogen, freezing those off or cutting them out. Occasionally we'll use radiation if these areas get very big. But this is what we're here to talk about tonight. So this is melanoma. Melanoma comes from those melanocytes in the skin, the ones that make the pigment. So when you have melanoma, oftentimes what we're looking at is a very dark pigmented skin lesion. These tend to grow quickly and change you know, over the course of a few weeks or months. Treatment for melanoma is actually we use many different kinds of treatments, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. There are two kinds of malignant melanoma. One is called superficial spreading, and the other is called nodular. Superficial spreading has to do with the horizontal growth phase of melanoma, so it grows more across rather than down. And the nodular is the opposite. It's growing up and down, kind of diving deep and that's the more worrisome one. This is a, a poster about where the common sites of melanoma are for women and men. You'll notice that on women, it's mostly the arms and the legs, and in the men, it's the neck, chest, and back. And this has less to do with the sensitivity of the skin to uh, sunlight more. It has to do with societal norms and the clothes we wear. For women, oftentimes, our arms and legs are more exposed. And for men, they're often more with the shirt off. So it has to just do with the, um, where you're getting your sunlight or your UV radiation. <laughs> this is a map of the world showing the incidence of melanoma. That's in the blue. On the bottom is the death rate for melanoma. And when I first looked at a map like this when I was in medical school, it was a little confusing to me because I thought, well, most of the sunshine is on the equator. So why on this map, why are the areas that have the highest concentrations where the darker blue is in the north and in the south? Didn't make sense to me. But there's a reason for it, and I'll show you it on a slide in just a bit. This is New Mexico. So this is what uh, melanoma looks like in New Mexico. Um, the, the areas that are gray and shaded, we do not have data for. So we're really looking at the colored areas. So blue has very little melanoma, and red has very high melanoma. Um, this is the incidence, I think, I think what the slide says, is between 2010 and 2014, uh, all genders, all ages, um, uh, all races. Okay. So in the U.S., the incidence is about 20 per 100,000 or 87,000 cases of melanoma a year. In New Mexico, we're at 16 per 100,000. And Los Alamos, let's see if I can find it. This little guy right here, um, you're pretty high at 42. 
So what, what causes melanoma? Why do people get melanoma? About 20% of the time, it is hereditary. So there are certain genes which run in families um, that can make melanoma more likely to happen. The remainder of the cases, the 80%, we think are environmental. Um, so let's talk a little bit about hereditary melanoma. So, so again, 20% of cases of melanoma uh, are hereditary. They run in families. Um, and uh, the most common uh, hereditary melanoma has to do with a gene called P16. This gene is important in cell growth. So it, it, it regulates the growth of cells. So when this gene gets mutated, cells just keep growing and growing and growing. There's nothing to stop them. And in fact, for people who have this gene mutation, about a 60 to 90% lifetime risk of melanoma. So really high, in addition to other cancers. The next two genes have to do with the BRCA2 gene. The BRCA2 gene, you might hear from breast cancer, right? This is the Angelina Jolie gene. Um, what this gene does is it helps to protect us from cancer. It's a gene that um, corrects any DNA damage or mutation um, to make cells more normal. So if you're missing this gene, you're gonna have more mutations happen, more abnormalities, and that can lead to cancer. And the last one is xeroderma pigmentosum. And this is a, a disorder that shows extreme sensitivity to UV radiation. When children have this, they get horrible sunburns even with five minutes of sunshine, you know, blistering sunburns. So it, it's usually very obvious uh, when, you, when parents bring in their kids if they have this gene. And these kids get skin cancer by the age of 10. So this is a really small slide. I'm sorry, it probably doesn't project very well. But when we think about risk factors, we think about things that are internal to us that we can't really change, like our genes, and we think of external things, things in our environment. And the most important things for melanoma are going to be uh, the, the exposure to UV radiation, mostly sunlight, um, and your skin type. Uh, so again, UV radiation and sunlight are the most important environmental uh, factors to go into melanoma. And the increase, there is an increased risk of melanoma in women under 40. It does, again, it doesn't have to do with their skin, that it's more sensitive or not. It has to do with our popular concepts of beauty uh, and skin color. So in the 1980s, having a tan became very fashionable. And also in the 1980s, tanning beds were created and introduced. And so this is one of my favorite cartoons. There's a tanning bed and it says, select a cancer. So tanning beds have been recognized by the World Health Organization as one of the high risk activities for melanoma. Um, and even some states have passed laws that minors cannot go to tanning beds either at all or they need their parents' permission. So we take tanning beds very seriously in terms of the risk for melanoma. And why is that? Well, UV radiation can cause direct damage to your DNA, to your genes. When UV radiation um, hits the skin, it can affect the DNA. The DNA can get damaged, and those, that damage can go on to promote cancer. So the DNA is damaged by the sunscreen. So that's one risk factor. The other risk factor is your skin color. This is a table of the Fitzgerald skin types. They're on a scale of one to six, with one being those redheads or really pale blondes that never tan but always burn. And then at the bottom, people who have really dark skin uh, who never burn at all. 
I like to think of it in terms of color. I'm more of a visual person than a graph person. Um, and so this is another way of looking at skin types, with one being the fairest and six being the darkest. So skin types one and two have the highest risk for skin cancer and uh, skin types five and six uh, have very low risk for skin cancer. And that gets us back to our map. So remember the equator is where we have all the sunshine, but it's also where we have the most melanin or pigment that's in the skin. And melanin is very effective at protecting us from UV damage. Melanin can protect against 99% of the UV radiation. So this is why skin cancer is much more common further away from the equator than closer to the equator. But that's not the whole story. UV radiation and skin type isn't always it because we know that there are melanomas that show up in other parts of the body where there are melanin but actually don't get that much UV radiation. Um, so some of the unusual types, this didn't come out very well, but that's the bottom of someone's foot. So there's this dark pigmented skin lesion right in the middle, right on the arch of the foot. Not a usual place that you would, you know, connect with sun exposure. You can also get melanoma in the eye. We have pigment in our eyes and our retinas and our irises, so you can get a melanoma there. And then, although this looks like someone just hit their thumb with a hammer, it's not. This is a melanoma that's growing under the nail. So this is called a subungual melanoma. So although UV radiation and skin type plays a large part of it, uh, it's not the whole story. Part of it is also genetics and other types of damage. Okay, so now that you know that melanoma can be found anywhere and are looking at your skin, trying to find out where yours is, um, this is how you identify a melanoma. You have to go back to kindergarten. You have to know your A, B, C, D, E's, and you have to remember the story of the ugly duckling. This is A, B, C, D, E. This is the easiest way that I remember to look at melanomas. So the A stands for asymmetry. Okay, so a nice benign skin lesion is going to be nice and circular. Melanoma is going to be irregular. So if you drew a line down the melanoma, one half would look different from the other half. It's not uniform. B has to do with borders. So when melanomas grow, they grow quickly and irregularly. So you always have this jagged border to a melanoma, whereas a, a benign skin mole is just gonna have a nice smooth border. C is color. Color can be variable in melanomas. You can have areas of darker pigment and lighter pigment. So if a skin lesion is not uniform, then it's suspicious. D is diameter. So the bigger the size of a skin lesion, the more likely it is to be a skin cancer. And they say that anything bigger than six millimeters is suspicious. Now six millimeters is about the size of a eraser on the end of a pencil, okay? And E stands for evolving. Skin cancers often change over time, right? They're growing and multiplying. So they will change their size, they can change their color, they can get more irregular. So if you see a mole and you watch it over time, it will change. And then this is the ugly duckling. So remember the ugly duckling was the swan with the ducks and he was bigger and didn't look the same as the rest. So you can see all the, the other skin moles on this particular person are small and uniform, but that one in the middle has a little red border around it. It's a regular, it's a little lumpy, it doesn't look like the others. That's what we mean by the ugly duckling sign. So, so you have a suspicious skin mole, then what do you do? You come in to see your doctor and we do a biopsy. What a biopsy is, is taking a small piece of that mole so that we can look under the microscope to find a diagnosis. And there are two ways of doing a biopsy. One is called a punch and the other is an excisional. 
So a punch, there's a little device um, that your doctor will use to literally take boom, a core biopsy of the skin. The excisional is where we take a scalpel and just remove the entire skin lesion. And then it goes to the pathologist, and this is how we make the diagnosis. Pathologists are doctors that are trained to identify cancers in tissue. So a pathologist can help us make the diagnosis. They can look for features that make the melanoma more or less likely to come back in the future. They can identify genetic mutations in the cancer. The one most common for melanoma is something called a BRAF gene mutation. And they can assess the risk of recurrence with something called molecular diagnostics, which looks at a number of genes in the cell to find out which cancers are going to be more likely to come back. This is what a pathologist sees when they look underneath the microscope. Okay, so there's a kind of a darker pink up top. That's the top part of your skin. That's the epidermis. Um, and this kind of salmon-y area down here, that's the dermis. So remember, the melanocytes make melanin. Melanin is our pigment. So these cells have the dark pigment in them. And they're, they normally, oh, where is this? Uh, normally are here in this basal layer. But you'll start to see here these dark cells start invading and getting into the dermis. So invasion is um, the hallmark of melanoma, when those cells start to get to places that they really shouldn't be. And the, how deep a melanoma is is very important for its diagnosis. The deeper the melanoma, the more dangerous it is because our blood vessels and our lymph vessels are on the deeper layers. And so the way that melanoma spreads is by getting down deep into that tissue. And so we do something called a Breslow score or a Clark steps to give us an idea of how deep that cancer has gone. And the depth, again, correlates with the chance of curing the melanoma. So a very shallow melanoma less than 0.5 millimeters um, has a great chance of cure, 90 to 95% just by taking it off. But as things get deeper, so this is five millimeters deep, um, then the chance of no recurrence drops to about 20%. One of the things the pathologists will look at is how quickly the melanoma is growing. And this is something called a mitosis rate. Um, what's there in the middle of the screen, if you remember back to your biology classes in high school, is cell division. So this is a cell that's actively dividing. And the pathologists let us know how many of those they see. The other thing we look at is, is this cancer likely to be spreading? So this kind of thin line here, that's the outline of a blood vessel. And smack in the middle is a hunk of melanoma getting ready to travel. So we can see this under the microscope. And again, identify who, which cancers might be at risk uh, for spreading. Same with nerves. You have a nerve cell in here and all these darkly pigmented cells surrounding the nerve and traveling up the nerve sheath are melanoma cells. So we talked about hereditary genes, so genes that get passed on in the family. But there are also somatic genes, so genes in the cancer itself that get mutated and changed that can um, uh, tell us whether a cancer is more or less likely to come back. And we know by looking at various stages of cancer growth which genes are more likely to be affected. And that's what's shown here. So there's that BRAF gene that's so important um, in melanoma. And this will come up later, because this is targeting this gene as one of our treatments. But there are other genes involved as well. So we know that the BRAF, although we can identify it, is not sufficient in and of itself to lead to cancer. There has to be a lot more DNA damage before you get there. And then there's personal medicine or genomics. So, you know, we try now to 
help people realize what their risk of recurrence is. And we do that not based on statistics, but what's going on in the cancer itself. So genomics helps us look at the DNA of that particular individual's cancer and gives us um, uh, an individual cancer risk. So this we use in the clinic a lot to try and get a handle on which cancer is more likely to recur and which patients would really benefit from additional treatment. So that gets us to say staging. So we've identified the abnormal mole, we've done a biopsy, we have our diagnosis, then what? We do staging. What staging means is how much cancer there is. Is it just in the skin? Has it started to travel? Is it in any other parts of the body? And we use surgery and imaging to do this. Surgery consists of um, doing a wide local excision, which means removing uh, the cancer and some safe surrounding tissue, as well as evaluating the lymph nodes in the region, um, and then doing imaging either with a PET scan or a brain MRI. And staging is important because of its connection to a prognosis. So if you look at the slide here, this is for stage one and two melanoma. That's the percent survival, and this is years. So people who have very early stage melanoma, stage one, just a small skin lesion, their chance of cure is very good. But as you get bigger and bigger uh, skin lesions, the survival decreases. So surgery, a wide local excision. So just a biopsy isn't enough because we know that sometimes melanoma can grow horizontally as well as deep. And sometimes what you see on the surface is not representative of what's below it. So surgeons will of, oftentimes have to go and take an additional rim of tissue around the skin lesion to make sure we get all of it out. Um, they will also do an examination of the lymph nodes in the area. So you know, if you have a, a melanoma on the leg, they would then look at the lymph nodes in the groin uh, to see if they're abnormal or not. If the lymph nodes are abnormal, then most likely the cancer has spread already. If they're normal, then a surgeon is going to recommend what's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, the risk of having a lymph node involved, again, has to do with that depth of the melanoma. Um, what we saw in the other slide, right, a really shallow melanoma has a better cure rate than a really deep one. And so, whoops. So a really shallow uh, melanoma has a very low lymph node risk, about 1%, whereas a greater than 4 millimeter uh, melanoma has a much higher lymph node risk at about 36%. So what is a sentinel lymph node procedure? We're doing this not only in melanoma, we also do this in, for example, breast cancer. What this means is that the surgeon will inject a dye around the site of the melanoma give it some time, let the dye be absorbed, and then look to see which lymph nodes are affected. And then once he sees, or she, sees the melanoma, uh, or sees the dye in the lymph nodes, they will remove that, and we can evaluate that underneath the microscope. So if the lymph nodes are involved, or if the sentinel lymph node is positive, I always recommend that my patients get some imaging so we can find out how much more melanoma there is. Has it just stopped at the lymph nodes or has it started to spread to other places? And this is a PET scan. This is a PET scan you don't want to have. Um, so the, the melanoma is here down on the leg. This is a picture of a body like this. So this is the melanoma in the leg and then all of these little spots in here are the places where the melanoma spread. Uh, PET scans are really sensitive and specific for melanoma, and we use them a lot in our diagnosis. Okay, so we've done our staging. Stage one is a very shallow melanoma, um, which, we, which we remove with the wide local excision, and the odds of this cancer being cured are very good. There's a 
10% relapse risk, or if you want to flip it around, a 90% chance of being cured if you have a stage one melanoma. So for patients who have a stage one melanoma, we don't do anything else, we just watch. Same thing with stage two, so a depth of greater than two millimeters, but not more than four millimeters, the risk is 20 to 30%. Again, the odds are in your favor, we don't do anything else but observe. However, when you get to stage three, or what we call locally advanced melanoma, this is when the lymph nodes are involved, um, then the risk of relapse gets much bigger, gets up to 60%. And then we do recommend going on to additional treatment, usually with a form of chemotherapy. Uh, and stage four melanoma, cancer is staged on a scale of one to four. Um, stage four melanoma is like that PET scan where there are multiple areas of melanoma through the body. Generally, this is felt to be an incurable cancer at this point, and we use many different kinds of treatment. We'll use surgery and radiation and chemo to try to um, give people more time. Okay, so, so again, for melanoma, once it's removed, um, if it's locally advanced, we do recommend chemotherapy. Sometimes we recommend radiation, usually if there's brain involvement. So I want to give you kind of a, an idea of what the treatment of melanoma is. So this is a slide showing the FDA-approved treatments for melanoma. And the first thing I saw when I looked at this was, that's not a lot of medicines. You know, if, you, if I put up a slide like this for breast cancer, there would be like 20 to 30 different drugs out there. And if you look, decarbazine, which is a traditional chemotherapy agent, was approved in 1976. The next drug was 1998. So you had this huge gap of time where we were doing research, we were doing trials, we were testing all these chemo drugs, but nothing was better. So until we get to 1998, where we run, uh, where high dose IL-2 was approved. High dose IL-2 is our first generation immunotherapy. And uh, this medication um, had uh, the, the reason why this medication was approved by the FDA is that there was a chance of curing people with this medication. But then there's this huge gap again between 1998 and 2011. And then you can see at 2011, all of a sudden we have an explosion of drugs. And that's because we have learned more about the immune system during that time. The basic research really pushed us to find these cures. And the other thing we learned about was genomics or how um, genes get mutated and form cancer and how to target those genes with drugs to turn off the growth of cancer. So I'm going to go a little bit into that. Um, this is technical. I apologize in advance. Um, if you're not technical, just we'll wake you up at the end of it. <laughs> but I'll try and explain a little bit about why we use the drugs that we use. So the traditional chemotherapy, that first drug to carbazine, this is a, a drug that gets into the DNA and disrupts it so cells can't grow and divide, a chemical drug. Um, this was FDA approved because it worked in 15% of people. That means 85% of people we were treating and they were getting no benefit, but it was better than what we had. So this was the drug that was approved. It increased the survival from less than six months to about nine to 12 months. So it gave people some extra time. The next drug that was approved was IL-2, and this was our first immunotherapy. Um, to better explain how immunotherapy works, I am gonna have to walk you through the immune system. I will go very slowly. We'll do an overview, um, and there will not be a quiz. So we, what, we know, whoopsies, what we know about the immune system uh, really is based on how the, or the research was initially done in how the immune system um, uh, fights infections. So, so that's where the, the, our basis comes from. So there's two kinds of ways the immune system 
fights infection. The first is with the humoral response. Um, and what that means is uh, that, body, that our bodies will make antibodies. Antibodies are protein that grab onto bacteria and tag them for the immune system for destruction. The other way of fighting uh, infections is direct cell-to-cell -cell damage. So um, these cytotoxic T cells will actually connect with cancer cells with bacteria and, and uh, destroy them on a one-to-one -one basis. How this works, when you get an infection, one of your cells called a macrophage, it's like our Pac-Man um, in the immune system, gobbles up some bacteria and then holds out uh, proteins and parts of the bacteria so that the immune system can recognize it. The cell that recognizes it is the helper T cell the helper T cell sends out messengers or cytokines to both arms to get the immune system revved up. So IL-2, our first generation immunotherapy is here, is, whoops, is a cytokine. It's, it, it amplifies the message. It tells the immune system to wake up, recognize there's something going on. And then once it does that, then the B cells can make the antibodies and the T cells can become active, and once they're active, then they can fight the infections of the cancer. So the second generation immunotherapies, all of those ones that were approved in 2011, those all act here, okay? So this is the second part of the activation of the immune system. All right. So IL-2, again, is a cytokine. It stimulates the T cells to grow and divide and recognize that there's something wrong, that they ha you have to recognize the tumor. So the FDA approval of this drug was, again, based on a 16% response rate. So 85% of our patients would not respond to this drug. But why it got approved, why the government thought that the data was strong enough that it was better than decarbazine, was that rarely, 6% of the time, people had an immune response that was long-lasting, and we could cure 6% of our patients, which again, was not zero. Low, but not zero. So that's why this drug got approved. Um, why was this immunotherapy not that effective? Why were only 16% of our patients responding to this? It has to do with the immune system itself and tolerance. So with your immune system, you don't want your immune system fighting your own body all the time, right? So, so tolerance has to do with the immune system recognizing what is natural and normal and part of your body um, and recognizing what is foreign and not. So the problem with IL-2 was that it stimulated the T cells but did not activate them. And when that, that second message didn't happen, the body thought, oh, well, this cancer is just part of me. I don't need to fight this. So it was missing that second signal. So that's why only 16% of people were responding to this drug. Then we went through a period where nothing was approved. We thought, well, if IL-2 worked and decarbazine worked, let's put them together. Unfortunately, what happened was the response rates were the same. It was still only about 16 or 20 percent, but people got side effects from both drugs. So it was kind of the worst of both worlds. While this was going on, um, research was being done in cancer and genomics. So starting in the 1980s, we first used molecular biology techniques to, to sequence genes and find out about our DNA. And then in 2003, the human genome was sequenced. Once we had that information, we could learn more about our genes and the gene mutations in our cancers. So for melanoma, the gene that is the most often mutated is something called a BRAF gene mutation. And this is present in over 60% of all melanomas. So with this knowledge, then the researchers were able to go back and target a drug against this gene mutation. So this is called targeted therapy, okay? Different than immune therapy. So targeted therapy 
takes aim at these mutated proteins in the cell and blocks them and turns them off. So BRAF is important in cell growth. It tells the cells, yes, you can keep going or no, you can't. With this gene mutation, this protein is always on. So it is always telling the cell, grow and divide, keep going. So when a drug was found that blocked this BRAF, it shut that signal off and cells stopped growing. The other thing that's important in this is, this is supposed to be your BRAF here, but there's also another protein called MEK, and MEK is important in this as well. It does the same job as, as BRAF. So they came up with BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors, and these are pills that people take. And they worked fantastic. So the BRAF inhibitors, 70% of patients responded which was fantastic. I mean, we're used to 16%, so all of a sudden 70% of people had their melanomas shrink. Um, and we went from an overall survival of nine to 12 months with decarbazine and IL-2, now up to 15 months with a BRAF inhibitor with these targeted therapies. And when we added the BRAF and the MEK together, survival went to 25 months. So now we were giving people more than two years after their diagnosis of melanoma with these oral inhibitors. And currently we use this for treatment in stage three and stage four patients. The other new development, the new uh, FDA approved drugs are these second generation immunotherapies. So remember the first one was IL-2 with the cytokines that stimulated the immune system. These uh, drugs activate the immune system. So it's that second step to try to prevent tolerance, to get the body to wake up and see these cancers. Um, there are two uh, different drugs. One is uh, something called Yervoy or Ipilumumab. Uh, the other ones are Pembrolizumab and Nivolumab. And they target two different pathways in the immune system. Um, I was watching TV the other day. I was shocked how many ads for uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab are out there. That's the Keytruda and the Opdivo. If you've seen TV at all, they're, they're all over the place. These are the drugs we're talking about. So this is a, a small cartoon about these drugs. So CTLA-4 or, or ipilimumab has to do with the recognition of cancer uh, by the T cell. And then the PD-1, the Optivo, and the Keytruda have to do with the activation of the T cell to fight the cancer. There is another way that we can activate the immune system. It's something called CAR T cells. And this is something that is still investigational. This is only done under clinical trial. What they do is they take some T cells out of the body, like a, a blood donation, you donate your T cells, they expose them to cancer in uh, the lab, and then they grow them up, so there's a lot of them, and then they reinfuse them in your body. So that's CAR T cells, that's kind of the next third generation type of immunotherapy. And let's see, and so this is basically how those Optivo and Keytruda work. Um, when PD-1 and PD-L1 um, uh, connect, this causes tolerance in the immune system. And so these drugs block that interaction and block tolerance from happening. Now, blocking tolerance is good when you're trying to fight cancer, but these drugs block them in a very nonspecific way. So the immune system is activated, but it's activated nonspecifically. So the side effects to these drugs are, have to do with the immune reaction to parts of the body. So you know, people can get diarrhea, they can get autoimmune colitis, they can get thyroid problems, problems with the adrenal gland, problems with the skin, because the immune system is attacking those areas instead of attacking the cancer. So we're not able really to direct this stimulation yet. Um, and this slide just has some of the, the numbers for us. So with Yervoy, 
Um, about 15% of uh, patients respond, but 20% of them, the responses last for over three years, and people are tentatively calling that a cure. The PDL1 uh, inhibitors, the Keytruda and the Opdivo, 30 to 40 percent of patients respond, and the overall survival, the median survival, is uh, three years. And we don't know what the long-term survival is because the studies are still going. You know, we just had these drugs approved, so we don't have long-term data yet. We're hoping that some of these long-term responders will have a cure of their melanoma. So, so this is where we are in modern therapy. For stage one and two, we just watch. We don't intervene with any drugs. Stage three, with that increased relapse risk of 60%, um, we do recommend additional treatment. The ipilimumab and the targeted therapies decrease the risk from 60 to 40. The newer drugs, the second generations, decrease the risk to 30%. So you're going from a 60% relapse risk to a 30% relapse risk, cutting it in half. And that's, that's amazing. Uh, so for stage four melanoma, you know, these are the three uh, types of drugs that we're using now. We're using the BRAF inhibitors. And again, we see amazing results with these. Um, one year survival is 90%. Uh, with these drugs. However, if you, if you watch and follow over time, um, these drugs become less effective. So there is resistance from the cancer to these drugs over time. Um, immunotherapies, people who respond usually respond for long periods of time, three years or more. And we're hoping that some of these long-term responders have a cure. And this is where we're going with our melanoma research. So that CAR-T that we talked about, that's part of what we uh, hope to work with here in 2018 and beyond. We're looking for ways to identify the patients that are going to respond to immunotherapy. We're also looking for ways to identify the patients that are going to have bad side effects to immunotherapy so we can find that out before we give the drugs. We're, we're mixing and matching, so we're trying to see what if, if one drug is good, if we combine it with another. There are some clinical trials looking at ipilimumab and nivolumab, and the overall survival rate at three years is now 60%. So, so these are all clinical trials that are ongoing. They're looking at vaccines for melanoma, and again, those uh, CAR T cells. And this is what CAR T cells are. So, it's a cartoon of a person. They give the blood cells. They activate those T cells that fight melanoma. They express the melanoma proteins. They grow up, and they get them back into the person to fight the cancer. So prevention is the best way not to get melanoma. We have these wonderful treatments now, but the best way is just don't get it in the first place. Um, you can't change your genes, you can't change your skin type, but you can reduce your UV exposure. So wear sunscreen, use it early, use it often. Um, you can cover up with clothing. Clothing can protect against UV exposure. Avoid midday sun between 10 and 2, and please avoid tanning beds. And then uh, if you do see a suspicious mole, you can report it to your doctor. <laughs> and that's all. Thank you. If there are questions that you've written down on the card, please flash the cards around. If you haven't done that, uh, just raise your hand. We'll try to go around and uh, pick up people. Yes, in the back of the room. A card? All right. Any more cards? Yes, there's some over here. Yes, we have a question. Any more? Don't see any more hands. 
There's your first round of questions. All right. <laughs> uh, why do you think the rate of melanoma is so high in Los Alamos? And um, that's a great question. Um, I think part of it has to do with your altitude. You're much higher up. There's more UV exposure up here. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to the genetics of uh, the population, so I don't know oh, what the composition is. Um, uh, but again, skin type and UV exposure is usually the, the most common risk factors that we have for melanoma. All right. Do squamous cell and basal cell cancers grow to melanoma? Uh, so no, they don't. So a particular kind of cancer stays that kind of cancer even if it grows and spreads. So a basal cell carcinoma usually starts as a basal cell, and even if it spreads, we still call it a basal cell. So there, one does not evolve into another. Um, does melanoma spread or grow in place? It does initially, right? You have the horizontal and then the vertical growth, and then if it gets into the lymph vessels and blood vessels, it can spread to the lymph nodes um, and then to other places in the body. Oh my, okay. <laughs> uh, this is pretty complicated. Let me look at the, the other question first. I'll get back to that one. Um, if you've had a basal cell or squamous cell, are you at increased risk for melanoma? The answer is yes. If you've had one uh, type of skin cancer, you are at increased risk, usually because that means that um, you've had enough uh, sun exposure that you're causing, uh, again, the DNA damage in all of the skin cells. So um, UV exposure causes also basal cells and squamous cells, so it's also a risk factor for those as well as melanoma. All right. I was diagnosed with melanoma in 2001 um, or excised at 0.6 millimeters. I have yearly skin scans and I cover my skin with clothing. Excellent. I was told I had something like a 95% chance of no recurrence. And that's true. So it's a shallow melanoma, um, but my is that my colonoscopies every two years always show up precancerous polyps. What are the odds that melanoma will turn up in my colon? So um, the chances are pretty unlikely. So the polyps that we see in the colon are adenomatous polyps or are kind of benign growths of the lining of the colon. Um, those polyps, uh, their biggest risk is turning into colon cancer. Um, so it's, it's unlikely that that would change into a melanoma. Where the melanin is tends to be more in the rectum and the anus and not so much in the colon. So the odds, I would say, are near zero that melanoma is going to show up in the colon. Are there any blood tests to give a heads up for this, like prostate cancer, right? So prostate cancer has a PSA. That's one of these uh, blood tests, these cancer markers that we use. So there is a, a blood test that is, uh, is under study um, for melanoma. It's called an S100. Uh, and this is a protein that is expressed on the surface of melanoma cells. Um, it's, it's under study right now to see how accurate a marker it is for melanoma um, at, by detecting it in the blood. So we don't use it routinely yet, but in the next couple of years we may get some more data uh, letting us know how uh, specific it is for the diagnosis of melanoma and we may use it at that point. But right now it's nothing that we use on a routine basis. Any other questions? There's one more on the table. Oh, thank you. How much sun 
tan lotion do we apply? Okay. Well, so if you're the, the one or two skin type, if you've got red hair like my daughter who drives me crazy because she won't wear sunscreen, um, you want to apply at least a 50 SPF and apply it every two hours. Um, if you have a type 3 and 4 skin, which is average risk, you can go down to like an SPF of 20 or 30, but again, you wanna apply it every two hours when you're in the sun. So the SPF doesn't mean it lasts longer, it just gives you more protection for a short time. And then if you're a skin type uh, five and six, really, you don't need to wear sunscreen. Okay. Are there any more questions? In the audience? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I remember that number that you showed at the beginning, 42 cases of melanoma in Los Alamos, in Los Alamos. 100,000. Well, Los Alamos has a very small population, and it's really hard mm -hmm. to extrapolate. So how good is that statistic, really? I mean, is that, is it really 42 per 100,000? I mean, that's so that, two or three. And, that's the statistics that are available through the state of New Mexico website. You know, I would also say that, um, here in New Mexico, you've got a great medical community and a great awareness of medical conditions. And so I, I think that probably people are being screened more here than in other parts of the state. And, and, and is that, uh, in Los Alamos, is mm -hmm. melanoma the most prevalent cancer? Are there others? Uh, no, you know, I, I think, and, and I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers for sure. Um, down in, say for example, in uh, Santa Fe, I know that in our population, colon cancer is the number one, um, regardless of gender. Uh, number two for women is breast cancer, for men it's lung cancer. Three is lung cancer for women and prostate cancer for men. So melanoma is kind of further down the line and uh, you know, I'm sorry, I just don't know the statistics here for Los Alamos. Yes, question number here. In the past few years, uh, there was a uh, diagnosis for cancer of the organs, uh, and they looked at ENOX2, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I'm not sure what it is, <laughs> but it, it, it's a uh, tracer for cancer, and the size, the length, or the volume of the ENOX2 varied with the organ that the uh, cancer occurred in. So my wife and I had that uh, test done about a year ago, and they've discontinued the test. And I just wondered if you knew anything about that. I, I don't know why, I, I don't know that much about the test, and unfortunately I don't know why it was discontinued. Um, a couple of years ago, the FDA um, was really looking at some of these diagnostic tests like the 23andMe um, because they were concerned that people were being tested and the tests weren't accurate enough. Um, and if you get you know, a positive test saying you're more likely to have cancer, that's, that's truly frightening. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that the testing that was, you know, being promoted and advertised really lived up to that. Um, but unfortunately, I can't speak specifically to that test. Another card. Thank you. Observations on vaccines or a melanoma attacking virus. So, so when I was in fellowship in Virginia, um, I worked in our melanoma department and we were looking at a vaccine for melanoma. So this goes uh, back to, oh, when was I in fellowship? Uh, 2000? 2000. Um, and we were looking at vaccines with and without IL-2 and, you know, we would get anecdotal, anecdotally um, a couple of patients who had a great response to the vaccine and their melanomas would shrink and go away and they would go into remission. Um, but, the, but the majority of people really wouldn't. Um, so we would give them the vaccine, you know, they'd get a sore arm, but would do nothing for their melanoma. So we know that vaccines work. We're still trying to figure out why they work in some people and not the other. 
Um, they're now looking at the vaccines um, plus our new immunotherapies to see if we can't make the vaccines work better um, and give a more long-lasting response uh, for melanoma. And then the melanoma attacking virus. So, so uh, this is something that's not available here. Um, this is uh, something that is available in Europe. Um, there's a country that had developed uh, a virus that uh, would grow and live only in melanoma cells, and then when they would grow, they would destroy the cells. Um, so we don't have a lot of information about that virus. It's fascinating, um, but it hasn't been tested here, so it's not one of our approved therapies. Other questions? Yes. Um, that question reminded me that I read someplace that an aspirin a day helps prevent colon cancer, mm -hmm. but um, but I've all, but in that same article it said that um, aspirin will help prevent colon cancer, but if someone develops colon cancer and has been taking aspirin, it's harder to cure. Do you have anything to say on that point? Yeah, so I don't know that much about the harder to cure part. Um, so colon cancers are very sensitive to um, a protein uh, it, that affects cell growth, and aspirin actually um, can modulate that protein. So that's why it's helpful in colon cancer. There, it's called the COX-2 inhibition. It's also being looked at in pancreatic cancer because that, that's also present in, in pancreatic cancer. So they have been um, uh, promoting the aspirin for people who are at high risk for colon cancer, so people who have a lot of family members uh, in the past that have had colon cancer um, for that reason. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, given that uh, detection at stage one and two is important mm -hmm. and keeping it from going to stage three and four, why do we not able to have better detection at stage one and two to prevent the progression to stage uh, three absolutely, and four? Absolutely. I agree with you. I think there should be more screening programs. Um, the other thing is that, so I, I think the lack of screening programs. Um, most of the times we rely on patients to bring us uh, abnormal moles rather than going to look for them ourselves. One thing that's been very helpful, at least to me in clinic, is if somebody comes in with a mole that I'm just not sure of, we whip out the cell phone and we take a picture. And then we have something to compare to you know, say, wait two months, has it changed? And you can look back and see. Sometimes these moles change so slowly that it's hard to recognize that they're changing. Uh, it would seem, maybe you answered the question before mm -hmm. from the gentleman up front. It would seem that if ultrasound is a very, if you will, a easier detection and more convenient detection in terms of the depth, because depth is what's, mm -hmm. what's determined uh, whether you're going to stage three or four. Yep. Y is there a limitation in terms of ultrasound at this point uh, to be able to diagnose stage uh, to the proper depth to determine whether it's stage one and two before proceeding to stage three and four? Correct, there is a limitation. So, so the ultrasound machines that we have don't get down to those you know, 0.1 millimeter accuracy. So it's, it's not helpful in determining the depth. The true depth really is just uh, able to be told after the biopsy. Any other questions? I think she may want to 
I think you may be able to walk up there and talk to her in private with other questions, if you will. That'd be fine. But in the meantime, let's thank Karen, uh, Karen LaRusso for Thank you for inviting me.